how many people in the room heard Spiros last year? All right, that's good. For those that um, did not hear him, he's got an amazing title. The business card is about uh, 30 inches long because it is Outreach Manager and Staff Researcher at Caltech's Institute for Quantum Information and Matter. Okay. What do you really do? Um, I split my time between outreach to the public in whatever way I can come up with and then research into the foundations of reality. So, the foundations of reality. Yeah, and it's interesting because I'm a quantum physicist, which means that uh, it's difficult to do outreach to seven-year-olds. But, um, <laughs> but it's very important, uh, I think, not because you know, I'm trying to teach them quantum physics, of course, but because if you can understand something about the universe at such a level, or if you can make somebody feel like they understand it, and that the questions that they have in their mind are actually valid, right? And we don't know as adults, as experts, the answers then it's, I think, very empowering for them. I've seen it time and again. Great. So last year, you gave a, a tremendous talk that um, entertained and, and interested us, since not everybody here heard it. Can you do a really short synopsis, just to bring everybody up to speed? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I graduated uh, with a PhD in mathematical physics from UC Davis. That was right after uh, I finished uh, with a bachelor's from MIT in computer science and mathematics. And it was a very interesting experience living um, the, the, my graduate studies going for a postdoc at Los Alamos. And then my advisor there, who had never had a student before, let alone a postdoc, said to me, OK, how, how about we start with something like, you know, interesting for you. There is this millennium problem, mathematical physics. Go find it at Princeton's uh, web page. And here's a book, good luck. Um, and Millennium Problems, you know, you, you can understand that uh, they've been open for, for decades usually. This specific one had, um, as of actually two years ago, seven Nobel Prizes to its name. People trying to make progress, you know, discovering new ideas around it, like figuring out why it works. Um, and the problem is called the quantum hall conductance. Um, how many of you have heard of it besides from me? Okay, there you go. <laughs> exactly. So I felt exactly the same way um, when he gave me that book. And the, per the person, by the way, who had written the book just won the Nobel Prize two years ago for whatever progress they had made. So I was completely lost. I had no idea what this was about, why it was interesting. I spent a lot of time reading popular articles about it and finding out that it was indeed a, a, a problem with such massive literature behind it that I was too stupid to understand it. So I ended up solving it by learning, I guess, from, from, from the bottom up everything that I had, I had to do. Right. And so I guess that was the key word, right? Because you were with us last year. You were working on this stuff. And That's you right. told the story of this um, tremendous challenge, these ups and downs of, of almost being there and not being there. but. So give us the update. Now you're here. Yeah, so the update is, um, so I want to clarify something. The problem was solved um, about nine years ago. So I solved it within a year of starting uh, to work on it. But it took six years for the uh, specialists to understand the solution and for me to get it published. And then three years later, which was a few months ago, the International Association of Mathematical Physicists, the the big one that decides potentially Fields Medals and Nobel Prizes and stuff like that. They also gave it the thumbs up. Um, Congratulations. Is, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was quite the journey. Uh, it was emotional in a sense. Um, I, my, my girlfriend is in uh, the back there, and it was uh, February 25th when I found out. And it was your birthday, so I couldn't celebrate as much as I wanted. <laughs> there was a better reason to celebrate. So. <laughs> Yeah, but, but she was very nice to me that day uh, because of that as well. She shared some of the, the spotlight. Um, but it was interesting because it was a story not of science, but of something we heard earlier. It was about emotionally engaging with the experts around the world that felt that this young upstart, at the time 10 years ago was even younger, right? You know, had just stolen away the spotlight from them. They had worked on it like their whole careers, right? They, some of them had Nobel Prizes already and so on and so forth. So who is this guy coming up and out of nowhere without using a lot of their tools? In fact, kind of saying like, no, those were the wrong, wrong tools. You know, two negatives were making a positive and you were making progress for the wrong reasons. 
and then say, okay, here is the real deal. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, I had to connect with them at the personal level. So I want to tie the concept we talked about last night of uh, pursuing your conviction versus consensus. And in, so you've mentioned already um, that the Nobel Prize has been awarded. I think you said to me before um, that it had been, at least two prizes had been awarded for, as you said, being right for the wrong reason. Yes. Right? And so uh, you pushed yourself uh, you know, against consensus view. Um, and I'd like to know, how did you drive yourself to be able to do that? Because unlike everybody in this room, once a CEO has taken money and they're committed down a path, you, know, you could have just said, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go work on another problem. Yeah, I really wanted to. Uh, <laughs> there were so many times. Um, but, and, and it's terrible, really, because I didn't have a team, right? You know, the world expert, um, or experts, I guess, could not make any progress. So they had, that's why they had put that problem up there um, as a millennium problem back in 99. And I, I couldn't really go to anywhere and say, eh, so, you know, give me a hint, anything, right? You know, how do I make the next uh, step? But I didn't have a choice, you know? I, it was me against that problem. And what ended up happening, the way I ended up solving it, was because I ended up respecting the problem as if it was a fall that was so much stronger than me. I couldn't talk, right? You know, I just had to learn how to just walk beside the problem and just learn. Just take it easy and, and not feel that this was going to, to ruin my life if I didn't succeed. Though there were many times when I considered calling my, my younger brother, who after MIT, he became a restaurateur in Boston and saying, I'm going to come and work for you. This business of science is not for me. But I stuck through it. And um, yeah, it was such a weird feeling when uh, I finally succeeded. I, didn't, I don't even remember like, what I, I was in Santa Barbara at the time for a workshop. Um, on quantum physics, and I just gave to my advisor the, the finished um, manuscript and said, okay, it's done. He's like, what do you mean it's done? He's like, that's it. Like, you know, just read it, like, you know, come back to me in a few days, and I'm telling you, it's done. He's like, but okay. So he went away. He's really smart, so it did take him just three or four days to figure out that it was done instead of six years, right? Um, and, and then he's like, all right, wow, let's go for drinks in Catalina Islands. He was not talking to me before that. He didn't consider me like, you know, worthy as an opponent. And once I solved the problem, of course, he's like, let's get beers. And it's like, <laughs> I've made it, you know? So. It's cool. So we just spent the morning talking about marketing and branding. Yeah. And you have created uh, quite a brand for yourself. Um, the late Stephen Hawking, um, actors Sharon Stone, Keanu Reeves, there's a whole long list of, of Hollywood stars that know who you are, and you've got your own fan club. As far as I understand, you haven't spent a dime on marketing. I think everybody here would love to know, how did you do that, and what can these um, uh, folks learn from a quantum physicist about branding and marketing? Let's see if I can. We want to know, right? That. Yeah, I guess. How do you? So, all right. So here's the scenario. Um, you have an event coming up in four weeks about Richard Feynman. How many of you say, like, you know, know this very um, famous Caltech physicist? He wrote like a bunch of uh, popular books on physics and so on and so forth. He's a brand unto himself, even though he's been dead now for 30 years. And he is more well known than the California Institute of Technology, where I actually work for, for the past eight years. So we use them wherever we can, uh, we can to actually, you know, put events to bring donors, money, and so on and so forth. And two years ago, I had to actually organize such an event, and I had exactly four weeks to come up with a way to create a video around a game that I was developing with a student from USC who had come to me uh, called Quantum Chess. So this is chess, but for true nerds, right? You know, into, you're playing in multiple universes at the same time. It's, it's crazy, but it's fun. So, so how do you make it fun, right? When you're like, this is a little too nerdy for me. Um, so I thought, okay, how about we get uh, Stephen Hawking to play against some, some Hollywood celebrity, right? And the celebrity wins, okay? Mm -hmm. It's like a twist, right? Great, that was my idea and I felt really good about it, but I still had only four weeks to make this happen before the event. Um, and so I reached out to Paul Rudd, 
And I knew him because I had consulted for you know, Ant-Man, the original, the first movie where he was a Marvel superhero. Can I just do a translation? That was Ant-Man? Ant-Man, that's right. right. So, um, and, and he said yes. So within like you know, a few days, I had my two main stars, Stephen Hawking also said yes. That was actually easier ask than getting Paul Rudd on board. Um, but then I had no idea what I was uh, supposed to do. Like I didn't have a script, I didn't have a director, I didn't have anything. I just went out there and just by the fact that I, there were people that thought highly of me, like uh, a friend of uh, Ken Reeves, a very good friend of him, is Bill from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. This is Alex Winter, he's a director. But I also needed a narrator for this video. And so reaching out to a common friend of both of theirs, the guy who wrote Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and a friend of mine apparently from, for different reasons, and the story here is all about connections. Connections that you never know you will actually activate until you do. And the worst thing is if you ask is that someone says no. Yeah. That's the worst thing. Yeah, They're not yeah, gonna, yeah. There's no bamboo under your fingernails or anything like that. No torture, nothing. There is nothing. That's it. Exactly. You just have to ask a question. And then because I found out, and it, this is amazing, uh, working with Sharon Stone or with Keanu Reeves, or, if you ask and they can do it, they will do it. Right? I reached out to Ed Solomon, who was the writer. Immediately, he's like, I have this great opportunity for you. I was actually at the Microsoft conference for quantum computing that day. And I'm like, I'm beelining out of here to call this Alex Winter guy. I Google him, of course. I'm like, oh my god, this is Bill from Bill and Ted. Um, and it's coming up, by the way, the third movie. So I'm excited about that one. But, but then she's like, oh, yeah, I'm a director. Oh, of course, yeah, I'll bring Keanu. I'm like, Keanu, Keanu, you're going to bring Keanu Reeves on board? Like, yeah, yeah, he'll, write a, you know, he'll do the narration. It'll be fun. I was like, of course, it'll be fun. I would love to be there. Um, I still didn't have a, a script, right? So in four weeks, I guess just by running through all the options I had in my life and everything I had done, everyone I had touched with my science or like, you know, talk to people, I ended up just because of Casey, my girlfriend there, she's like, you're so stressed, you should just go hang out with your best friend, Jose. And I did, just to play some video games. And at the end of the night, he turns to me, and he's usually not a very perceptive guy when it comes to social cues and stuff, right? <laughs> but he's like, you seem pretty down. Is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, you know, I just have to do this thing. I have a story, I have no idea how to write a script. He wanted to be a scriptwriter like nothing else in life. He was taking like, you know, night courses and all that stuff. He was a scientist. He's like, oh, why don't you just send me, you know, some notes you have? I told him Paul Rudd was on board, Ken Reeves. He was salivating, but he was holding it in. He did not sleep at all. That uh, it was a Saturday, Sunday. Sunday around like 3 p.m. I get a full script, like a real one. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Of course, I send it to Paul Rudd, I send it to Hawking. We literally had the whole thing done a week before the event mm. for, for $30,000. And the reason why I had to pay 30000 was not because of any of the talent, because, you know, the, the cameraman and the sound and the uh -huh. mixing and the editing, those are the people that, like, you need to pay them something. They're going to be for free, right? Yeah. So, and that was probably the cheapest, like, you know, viral video I've ever done. So That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Um, so congratulations. We have a little something for you. Oh. I believe it's under this table. So it's not a bottle of wine, even though we're here in Napa, but it's something that a math geek would absolutely love. Let's see what this is. Oh, the Galton board. This is beautiful. And this is from your TED talk, isn't it? Well, just uh, no one can see what that is. Maybe the camera can zoom right in. But so, yes. Wow. Um, thank you so much. This oh, is yeah. really cool. The idea for this is that you throw these little um, balls from the top, and then they have a way of sorting themselves out. And the way it sorts out is through this, what is called a Gaussian distribution or a bell curve. Um, I think this is really cool, why? Because currently what I'm working on, I think that's what you're trying to get me to, uh, to, to talk about. I'm trying so really hard. My, uh, my, <laughs> my current research is uh, at the foundations of reality itself, right? You know, where the space and time come from. But then when you go to that level, then you realize you have to answer even deeper questions like, are there laws of physics and where do they come from? And then more specifically, where does truth come from, right? So how can you push yourself towards uh, always being right, realizing that uh, at the bottom of it all, it's very pluripotent. There is a chaotic like mess. Everything is possible, but yet certain patterns emerge as you zoom out, you know, so. 
It's um, wow, really cool. So that's another way of him saying that what we're all working on here and how we're going to solve all the problems facing all of our startups are piece of cake. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much okay. for having me.